now, I guess the main thing I'd want to say is when we read the Old Testament passages, we can't just import them directly into our context. We need to look at how they lived faithful relational lives and spiritual and sexual lives in their context and what it can teach us about ours. Where our contexts are the same might have a lot to say, where they're different might be different. This was originally an eight-week Set, series of uh, eight sessions over eight weeks, uh, which I've tried to crunch down into this hour. So let's take one deep breath. That was 500 million years. Now we're just looking at a thousand years. Not comprehensively, but just to try and flag some things that we often don't notice when we talk about the scriptures. And particularly, uh, some of you would be aware, we're heading towards or we're in a discussion about a theology of marriage at the moment. And uh, my hope is that when we do that, we will actually remember all of the richness of the Christian scriptures about that. Um, sometimes people just want to say we should live according to the biblical norm, but we'd need to ask which one. I want to start with something positive. And I should have said that if you're under 21, you should probably close your eyes at the moment because you're not meant to read this, at least not when it was written. This is the Song of Solomon. In fact, unless you're male, you should be closing your eyes. And in fact, amongst the men, only those of you who are married are allowed to read this. Okay, But living in the permissive 21st century as we do, we'll let everybody read the Bible today. And I'll just read you like a little bit of it, because it's worth remembering that the Hebrew people, in many ways, were a lot less hung up about sex than we sometimes are, particularly in the Western church, although in some other ways, much more so. So this is, this is the Hebrew sealed section of the scriptures. You weren't allowed to read it unless you're a 20-year-old, 21-year-old male who was married. And this is why. My love is a gazelle, a wild stag. There he stands on the other side of our wall, gazing between the stones. He says, your breasts are two fawns, twins of a gazelle, grazing in a field of lilies. Kiss me, make me drunk with your kisses. Your sweet loving is better than wine. Awake, north wind, O south wind, come, breathe upon my garden. Let its spices stream out. Let my lover come into his garden and taste its delicious fruit. Is that enough? You get the gist. Okay? You can read the whole thing later, but sex is good in the Old Testament, okay? At least in this verse. Now, the hysterical thing, of course, is that many Western Christians, uh, particularly in England, could not cope with this at all and had no idea why it was in the Bible at all. And so what they said is, well, this isn't really about two people. It's a metaphor for God and the church, which is hysterical. <laughs> I invite you to read the Song of Solomon and work out which one's meant to be God and which one's meant to be the church. And if you can not laugh, then um, you'd be doing better than me. But it's, it kind of shows just how much trouble we had with the idea that uh, people might enjoy sex and actually write about it and talk about it. So let's look at some of the more troubling aspects uh, of sexuality and relationships in the Old Testament. Lamech took two wives. The name of one was Adar and the name of the other was Zillah. Got a whole lot in the notes here, but all I'll say there is that uh, polygamy was part of the Hebrew tradition from about the seventh generation. If you start with Adam and start reading the Bible, within seven generations we're at Lamech with his two wives. And that made sense for many reasons, one of which was that in that culture where there's a lot of war going on, when you read the Old Testament, you see they're always battling and fighting. Lots of the men are being killed in wars, so you end up with few men and a whole lot of women. If women aren't allowed to own property and are basically just chattel, then the only way that women are going to survive is if they've got a husband. But if a whole bunch of the husbands are dead, what do you do? Well, you marry lots of women to one man. So in their context... Polygamy made perfect sense. And as I said, all around the world, different cultures have decided that polygamy makes sense for them at times. But it doesn't always go well. Sarah, Abraham's wife, took her slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband as a wife. That's an interesting ethic for sexuality in the 21st century. He went into Hagar and she conceived, and when she saw she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. So then Jacob goes into Rachel as well. Oh, sorry, this is a different story. Where we have a... Jacob, who wants to marry Rachel, but he gets given her sister first, and then he works for another seven years and gets given Rachel. So he uh, loved Rachel more than Leah, but when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. So polygamy worked to keep women alive and to keep them in touch with some resources, but it didn't always go all that well. Jealousy is a pretty common human emotion. 
different people have come up with different ways to try and mediate that a bit. But, um, yeah, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Just because polygamy happened doesn't mean it's necessarily a good idea now. And the other thing, of course, that was happening uh, back then was around divorce. And because women were treated as property, men were able to get rid of them fairly freely, but not all the prophets were happy about that. Let the Lord be a witness between you and the wife of your youth. Don't be faithless to the wife of your youth. In other words, marry more women, sure, but don't then dump the old one, because what's she going to do to make a crust? You have to keep all of your women. And we see it in the Ten Commandments, this thing about property. And if it seems like I'm banging on a bit too much about women being property, we need to remember that whenever we're reading anything about the sexuality and relationships of the Old Testament. Don't cover your neighbour's house or any of their other stuff, including their woman. To make that even more emphatic, if you buy a male Hebrew slave, he's got to serve you for six years, but then goes free in the seventh. But if you've given him a woman to be his wife and he's had some kids, you get to keep the woman and the kids. He doesn't keep, he can go free, but you get the woman and the kids to keep working for you. Another incredible sexual and uh, relational ethic. Yes, marriage is fine, but it's not a lifelong union. It only lasts for as long as you belong to your master, and then after that you split, and uh, the master gets the kids and the wife. Even when love was involved, the path wasn't smooth. And that's, as I said, this is the story of uh, Jacob, who loved Rachel, worked for seven years to get her, and then got Leah as well. Sometimes love was involved, but there was also some kind of pragmatism, as we see in the second verse there. The congregation sent 12,000 soldiers, this is the Hebrew people, and commanded them, go to the inhabitants of Gabish Gilead and put them to the sword. All the women and the little ones, every male and every woman that's lain with a male, devote to destruction. In other words, if the woman's had sex and therefore might be pregnant, kill her. But all the virgins that you find, take them and we'll give them to this tribe of uh, Judah who don't have any wives. Very pragmatic, hardly an ethic that we want to bring into the 21st century. Men could have sex with their wives, of course, with more than one and with their concubines and with any other woman as long as they don't already belong to a man or they weren't worth some money to their father. If a woman was raped, that was judged on property grounds. If she was engaged or married, then she already belonged to someone else, so the man was killed. But if she was a virgin, then the punishment was to preserve the social order and to protect her a little bit. So if you meet a virgin who's not engaged and sees and lie with her and you get caught, then you've got to pay 50 shekels to the woman's father and she'll become your wife and you're never allowed to divorce her. That's the only woman you can't divorce is someone that you raped and got caught raping. Because if she was cast aside, it's very unlikely that anybody else would take her. And here, how's this for a sexual ethic? When a man dies and has no son, his brother shall go into the wife and take her in marriage so the firstborn can be named after the father. And of course, in the Hebrew scriptures, women are allowed to insist if their husband dies that their brother-in-law take them in and have sex with them and continue the family line. Women have to be virgins when they're married, but it's assumed that men won't be. And the use of prostitutes in the Old Testament is simply mentioned. If you read everything about prostitutes in the Old Testament, it's just what you do, unless you're a woman, as we'll come to in a second. Proverbs has this advice for the blokes. Keep your father's commandments and don't forsake your mother's teaching. To preserve you from the wife of another, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Adultery was very bad because the women belonged to other men. And if you commit adultery, they might end up pregnant with your child and not the bloke's child, not their husband's. Don't desire the beauty of a married woman in your heart or let her capture you with her eyelashes. A prostitute's fee is only a loaf of bread, but the wife of another stalks a man's very life. And it goes on to basically say, if you have sex with someone's wife, they're going to come after you and kill you. Who would want to do that when for a loaf of bread you could sleep with a prostitute? Different matter if you're a woman. Good Jewish men sleep with prostitutes, but good Jewish girls are burnt alive if they are one. Tamar's story. Does everyone know the story of Tamar? I'll, I'll, let's skim over it. So uh, Tamar, uh, her husband dies and she comes to her father-in-law and says, right, give me your next son to be my husband, as is my right, but he refuses. So uh, she's in trouble. What's she going to do for a crust? So she throws off her widow's garments, puts on a veil, sits by the side of the road. Her father-in-law comes past, thinks he's a prostitute because she's covered her face, says, come on, let me come into you. And she says, only if you'll give me your signet ring and staff as a pledge which he does, and then he goes off. Three months later, he finds out that his daughter-in-law, Tamar, has been acting as a prostitute. 
Moreover, she's pregnant as the result of her whoredom. So he says, bring her out and let us burn her. And she was brought out, but she sent to her father-in-law the signet ring and the staff that he'd given her when he slept with her. And suddenly he goes, oh, okay, she's actually in the right more than I am. You can have my second son to be your husband after all. And he doesn't lie with her again, which is reassuring, given that she's his daughter-in-law. So using prostitutes is fine. Being a prostitute will get you killed. Even, if, uh, even not being a virgin if you're a woman is a capital offence. Marrying lots of women is okay. Raping a virgin is okay, but then you have to marry her and can't divorce her. But some marriages aren't okay, and particularly this one. When the Jews come back from exile in Babylon and start rebuilding the city and reforming their faith, this incredibly disturbing thing happens. And it's recorded here in Ezra. The people are convinced by the prophet of their sin, and they sit down and say, we've broken faith with our God, and we have married foreign women from the people of the land around us. But even now there is hope for us, despite the fact that we married foreigners. Let us make a covenant with God to send away all these wives and their children. If any man refuses to divorce his wife, all of their property will be taken from them, and they themselves will be thrown out. Okay? Marrying foreigners is a very, very bad thing to do. And if you do, you must divorce them and cast them out, even though to cast out a bunch of women and their kids, the likely result for those women and kids is going to be very unpleasant. If you actually have some integrity and refuse to divorce your wife, then you get thrown out as well. To argue that the Bible is against divorce is incredibly simplistic. This is even more disturbing, I reckon. What happens if you go away to war and come back and you think your wife's got knocked up by somebody else? There's a bit of a bump showing and you accuse her of having slept with somebody. This is what happens in Judaism. If a man becomes jealous of his wife and thinks he's had an affair but he can't prove it, they go to the priest. The priest makes her take this oath. If you've gone astray under your husband's authority and defiled yourself with some other man, now may this water that brings the curse enter your bowels and make your womb discharge and your uterus drop. In other words, if you suspect your wife of having had an affair and being pregnant, the priest gives her a potion which will cause her to have an abortion. She drinks it. If she does have the abortion, then everyone knows that she was guilty and she's stoned to death. If she drinks it and doesn't, then she's declared guiltless and the husband is fined and never allowed to divorce her again either. So in the particular situation of a man being suspicious that his wife has slept with another man and got pregnant, the Bible doesn't just condone but actually demands abortion. <coughs> Again, that's a surprise to some people. The Bible isn't against abortion, carte blanche. I don't think we've got time for that one. Let's have a quick recap. Actually, we haven't even got time for that. Let's keep rolling on. <laughs> oh, let's, let's recap that bit. So this is the Old Testament. Okay, and even if you don't believe everything that I've said, you can go and look up those verses. But here's the context in which we need to approach the Old Testament when we think about our current theology of marriage. It assumes polygamy, at least if you're wealthy enough to have more than one wife, or if your, brother's wife, if your brother dies and you need to take on his wives. Condones having sex with prostitutes, but not being one. Recommends prostitutes in preference to married women because it's much cheaper and less dangerous. Insists on female virginity, but assumes that males will be promiscuous. Makes men who force sex on virgins pay compensation and marry the woman. Allows men to divorce women except for a very few circumstances and insists on divorce in the case of mixed marriage and insists on abortion or termination in the case of infidelity. Why? Because it's all about the man and his property and there'd be nothing worse than your wife being pregnant to someone else because then their kid will get your property. They lived in an environment where they, had, they were a pretty small population Men died in wars. Men owned all the property, including women and children. So husbandless women were really vulnerable. Barren women were shamed or cursed, and all through the Old Testament, to not be able to produce children is seen as a terrible curse. There's no protection from sexually transmitted diseases, of course. Contraception basically means just trying to withdraw in time, which again is condemned, and there's the story of the man whose brother dies and whose wife insists that he sleeps with her, but he spills his seed on the ground instead of inside her and keeps doing it till she realises what he's up to and he gets in terrible trouble. And insists... And, um, yeah, small population, so they're trying to grow. Everything is about getting more and more people so the Jewish nation can get bigger, especially when the men keep dying in wars. The purpose of the laws 
was to grow that small population, expand the kingdom, to maintain this patriarchal community where men owned everything and got to hand on what they owned to the next generation, to protect male property rights, and to offer some protection for women from abject poverty. That's the context they lived in, that's what they were trying to do, and that's how I believe those laws arose. 